they kind of work in different ways. So I've got them, about seven I think, have been provided by our sponsors and for which we're very grateful. Um, the first of which is the Trinity College, I hope that's the right, and it will be drawn this afternoon. And I'll explain how we'll do that in a moment. And then after that, Oxford, they're offering a draw each day for these two books. Then Lexical Lab, which Hugh Della, who some of you might remember from this morning's talk, he is, he's mentioned this course that he's offering. Now, that will be drawn also this afternoon, so you will need to fill in the form to apply for that. Interestingly, and this is quite important, if you can't attend the course yourself, because Hugh is offering a free course in London, you can put in the name, you can put in the name of somebody else. Okay, so if you've got friends or colleagues or students or someone else you would like to nominate for that, you can. Okay, so that's quite important. So that will be drawn this afternoon. And then Nile, uh, Norwich Institute of Language Education, they are offering, they have a large online school now, and that Nile, if you know, is a teacher training institute. They are offering a free online course, and that will be drawn tomorrow. Macmillan are offering these, which are also being drawn tomorrow. So these are, as you can see, books. And lastly, I think, Marex Tefel Equity Advocates, he's got a large online school with a catalogue of courses there. So he's offering as prizes some free courses as well as 50% discounts to people who register using this uh, coupons code, ILS Bruno, that probably says Bruno, sorry, 17. And, but people need to register for that by um, midnight on Sunday after the conference. And once again, if you would like to enter some other people for that, you may do that, and that will be drawn on Saturday. So that's it quickly. I'm sorry I have to move so quickly through this. If you would like some details about the Nile course, you can speak to me. If you'd like more details about the Lexical Lab, speak to Hugh, and if you'd like to know more about the TEFL Advocates course, speak to Marek. Marek, could you stand up? So that's Marek. If you would like to speak to him, um, do so, so you can find out exactly what's being offered. The, in order to enter these three um, free courses or prizes, there are three bowls on the registration desk now. Each one has its own name, those three courses. So just write your name and, uh, name and contact on a piece of paper, put that into the bowl from which we shall draw those courses. I hope that's clear. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce Philip Kerr, who is a, our first plenary speaker this afternoon. Uh, Philip, um, well, we all, we all think we know every name in the field because we all we think we know that the people we know are well known in the field and I was talking about this with Philip last night and it is quite amazing really significant people that we know other people don't know I've been in places where Scott Thornbury's name is not known and I won't even mention the people who are in the room at the moment who also fall into that category but there are people really well known in the field who are not known um, so I'm not sure how many people know Philip Philip thinks that probably not everybody is familiar with him um, he doesn't live very far away. It's how far? An hour and a half. An hour and a half. Okay. He lives in Vienna. And, but you're not Viennese, are you? No. Where are you from? London, mate. How am I going? <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts? Um, <laughs> actually, it's a, it's a little part of, it's a suburb of London, northwest. No one would have heard of it. Called? Um, called Ricelip, where I was. I've never heard of that. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank but, you very much. <laughs> but I never thought I was a Londoner when I grew up there. No? We used to go to London. Oh, because it was so far out? Because it was so far, so far yeah, it was yeah. an hour on the tube. Oh, God, how awful for you. Not London. <laughs> well. <laughs> and uh, Philip uh, is mainly involved in writing course books at the moment. He, he gives lots of presentations and workshops around the world. The world or mainly Europe? Uh, the world, I guess. The world, I guess. Okay, whereabouts? No, don't worry. Um, and what do you love about course book writing? Because I think it must be a dream job. 
James, it, uh, James asked me earlier if, he, <laughs> if I would mind if he asked that question. And I said, no, don't ask that question because I'm going to be too negative. So I've had a few minutes trying to think about the positive sides of writing course books. I used to really, really love it because we used to have a lot of freedom. Now the problem with writing course books, um, a bit like what Jeremy was talking about, everything has to be measurable in terms of bloody outcomes. Everything has to be tagged, you know, vocabulary has to be tagged to level. And one of the reasons that most books are looking pretty much the same these days is that all the publishers are trying to do the same thing. So I enjoy a certain amount of the freedom and the creative opportunities of writing different kind of texts. But the things I enjoy most about it now are working with the colleagues that I write with, because it's through working with them that I feel that I'm developing or learning something myself. And I've just finished a project working with Lindsay Clanfield, Ben Goldstein and Kerry Jones. And it's just been wonderful working with these three other people. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever write one on my own again. So that, that's what I really like. I mean, it's, it's been nice. I've been all over the world because of it. Uh, but but it, it's getting harder and harder and harder. And to, be, I'm, to be original? Well, get, being original is practically impossible because all of the syllabuses are so prescribed uh -huh. and the topical things are... But the challenge there is, I mean, it's like any kind of writing. You've got a form, mm -hmm. a, a format, you've got constraints and you've got to work and try to do something different. But then the frustration is when the editor says, well, present continues, why don't you do a diary activity? Oh, no, not again. We've done that so many times. And, and so have the students. And so have the students, yeah. So, I mean, have you, have you heard of the game Alibi? An editor said to me recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, it, it's hard. All right. Okay, so thank you. So just before, one last thing before Philip starts. Remember that after the last plenary this afternoon, there will the today's speakers will be sitting here and you'll be asking them questions and the questions should come from you. So after the last plenary, there is a coffee break. So we would like to collect your questions then. So keep producing your questions, please. Okay, thank you, Philip. Thank you, James. I'm working with James as well very soon on, on a project. We started a little bit, a bit different. Uh, James mentioned that um, I'm probably most well known as a course book writer and I've, I've been to the Czech Republic quite a number of times and uh, the, the thing that's most popular here is a course called Straightforward. And the publishers, Macmillan, asked me to tell you that if you wanted to see this book, it's on the stand. So I've, I've done that. But I'm not talking about course books at all now. Um, I'm talking about translation. And I published a book about three years ago called uh, Translation and Own Language Activities, which um, won quite a few of the prizes, British Council prizes, things like that. And I've been lecturing about it for about six years now. So this is not the first time that I've addressed the topic um, in the Czech Republic or even in Brno. Um, and I've talked about it more often in Slovakia. Uh, and I can remember still a conference, I don't know how many years ago now, in Bratislava, uh, where I began the, the talk by asking the teachers this question. Could you don't respond? I'll explain why. Could you please put up your hand if in your classes, in your English classes, you sometimes or often use the student's language. Back in. And when I asked this question, a few uh, very tentative hands went up. I then asked, well, okay, fine, so now put up your hand, please, if you just only teach English through English. And almost everybody else's hand went up. At the end of the talk, I asked the same question. Could you now please put up your hand you know, if often or sometimes you use the student's language, the shared language in the class, and 90% of the hands went up. 90%. And it was interesting as they did that, because as more hands went up, people in the room were looking around. Oh, I could admit it too. So what we discovered there is, um, and it's fairly clear, is that people lie. <laughs> they, they lie about their classroom practices and, and you know the language you use to talk to your students is, is kind of fairly central. I'd like to give you two other illustrations of that. Um, quite, a little bit of, quite a bit of research has been done into the way that teachers use uh, the students language in the classroom. Here, check. And what happens there in this research is uh, we typically ask teachers to put a figure on how much of your teacher talking time is in Czech and how much of it is, is in English. And we get whatever responses we get. We then measure it. And the problem with measuring it is that when we 
If you tell teachers, we're going to record your classes to measure how much Czech and English you're using, what you find is that they only really use English. So, in order to do this research, we have to be uh, a bit more careful than that, and typically what happens is we will set it up so we'll tell teachers that we are monitoring aspects of their classroom practice without talking about the language, and that we will be recording their lessons. And we say we'll be recording them periodically, not all of the time. And the reason for that is we discovered very quickly that they modify their behavior when they're being monitored. Yeah? So it's, it's often the case that we have to wait for a couple of months, typically. If we're doing it in a high school, it would be towards the end of the first term, or the end of a term, that we're beginning to get a picture of what probably goes on typically. What did we discover, and this, this has been replicated a number of times, what we discovered was that if a teacher says that typically she uses Czech 10% of the time, the reality is more like 25%. And that if a teacher says that she uses Czech, let's say, 20% of the time, typically it's about 50% in reality. And if they say, well, probably 50% of the time, half and half, the reality is more like, well, actually 80% of the time. So teachers are systematically underestimating the amount of uh, L1 that they're using in the classroom, and they're tending to lie about it. And I'm not saying they're trying to be duplicitous. That's what they're doing. The third little thing I'd like to illustrate this with is in my own work as, as an inspector, or as, a, as, a, as an evaluator of teachers. I'm going in at the moment, I'm going in watching uh, teachers uh, towards the end of their final year of teacher training, or in their first year when they, they've qualified, they have to come back to college with me, and they they do one, one day a week in service training, and I sometimes go in and watch them. And whether these lessons are formally evaluated or not doesn't really change anything. They think I'm evaluating them. Yeah? And what we discover systematically when we do this is they never bloody speak German at all. And it's simply not credible. So the fact that I'm in the room is making them go for English only. Now, all of this suggests um, a number of things. First of all, the, the use of L1, the shared language in a classroom, is widespread. Almost everybody does it, and almost everybody does it quite a bit. But there is a sense of guilt. There is this sense that we shouldn't be doing this. It would be so much better if it was you know, English only. So there's this perception that English only is the best way to do it, but for practical reasons, it's not always possible. And as a number of commentators have said, Whatever else you might think about this, teachers carrying along a burden of guilt is not a particularly healthy way to approach their work in the classroom. Let's at least get rid of the guilt. So I didn't ask you at the beginning to put up your hand and say, you know, do you use Czech often or sometimes? Um, because it's quite an embarrassing thing, or potentially an embarrassing thing. There are a number of problems with the whole issue here I'm using the term L1, but for something which is so central to our practice as language teachers, we don't really have an accepted or acceptable way of referring to this other language. In the past, um, people would talk about native language. Native language is clearly not an acceptable term nowadays because of the connotations of the word native. Um, more recently, people were using the term mother tongue. So there's a book by Mario Rinvalucri and Sheila Della from about 15 years ago, a practical book, which is quite good, and it's called Using the Mother Tongue. But mother tongue is also problematic because often the language which we're referring to is not the language of your mother. Why are we talking about mothers here? And this is increasingly the case in the kind of multicultural, multilingual cities that many of us are living in. I mean, Vienna is perhaps a particular example. If you go into a, a typical high school in most parts of Vienna, uh, you'll have something between 20 and 90% of the children whose first language, whatever we want to call it, is not German. It could be Arabic, it could be Farsi, it could be Albanian, it could be so many other languages. But it's not, their dominant language is not necessarily the language of their mother. So mother tongue is problematic, and the one that seems most neutral is to talk about first language, or L1. But we do have a problem here, I mean, I'm, I'm using L1, we do have a problem here because uh, it's not always clear what the first language is. Is it the language which you first acquired? And if it's the language which you first acquired, what about all of those people who lost that first language? And there are millions of them all over Europe. They just lost it. Um, 
my second daughter is, is a case in point. She grew up first four or five years of her life in the UK. She was bilingual, as good as you could be. But then she lost it. She lost it actually when she moved to Belgium and uh, she went into English classes and the teacher started correcting her pronunciation systematically. One of the most dangerous kind of things that can happen. So what's her L1? Well, it's actually not... I mean, her dominant language is French, but that was very clearly an L2. So L1 is slightly problematic, and this raises an interesting question. First of all, we don't really have an accepted way of referring to this other language, the shared language. Uh, and we also have uh, a world of applied linguistics, which is centrally concerned with second language acquisition theory. But if first language is a problematic term, then second language clearly is too. So the whole business of SLA is, is in a sense, uh, wrongly named. I've, uh, I've used the term own language, and own language um, was, I think, coined by Guy Cook, who we had hoped would be here. Own language is, in a sense, more... It's preferable because it indicates this sense of ownership. Uh, but there are times when the term own language doesn't work either. The point I simply want to make is there is this absolutely central thing in any kind of uh, language teaching practice, and we don't have an accepted way of talking about it. And until quite recently, it was absent. You look at any of the teacher training manuals, the Bibles, things like uh, Jeremy's Practice of English Language Teaching in its first edition, it just wasn't there. This has changed in recent uh, editions and in, in newer books, but this was never talked about. In my own teacher training, nobody ever talked to me about what I might do with the shared language. It's the elephant in the room. Well, there are a number of positions that we can adopt when it comes to this other language. I'll call it Czech for the moment. Um, the, the default position, the thing that most people seem to agree, is that the best way to learn English is through English only, in a naturalistic way, and that we should ban any other languages coming into the room. That's the kind of default respected position and what is promoted uh, in most of the literature still. The exclusion principle. On the other side, the open door, is a recognition that, well, perhaps uh, there are many reasons why making leveraging check in the classroom might be very positive. And we should, at times, actively encourage the students to make direct comparisons between what they're learning English and, and their home language. It makes sense. And there will be other reasons I'll explore why it might make sense. And then somewhere in the middle, there's the sort of half open door, what's been called the crutch position that's a crutch that you lean on, where you use this home language when you need to. And that's probably what most people adopt. So we've got this situation where most people, it seems, uh, accept that the best way of teaching English is through English only. Why? Why has this evolved? I'd like to just give you a few minutes to talk with a partner. What possible reasons could there be to support the claim that English is best learnt only through using English? English. I'll give you a few minutes to talk about it. <clears throat> question. Yeah. Is, is uh, there a problem if you uh, if the teacher doesn't speak Czech? I'm going to come to that. I'll come to that. I'm going to address that but, issue. But the students are talking in the first language. It's not a problem. If somebody it's discovered something, yeah, I know it.
Right, I'd like to interrupt you there. Um, primarily because I don't want you to waste too much time talking rubbish. <laughs> I, make, I make my position very, very clear. I'm going to look at these reasons, and I suspect that all of the things that you suggest will come up. Um, so using English only, the target language only, the commonest reasons that are given is one, that translation is not an important skill to learn. Yeah? And that's partly because what we do is we associate using L1 with this old-fashioned grammar translation stuff. The kind of lessons I had as a kid, where we learning French, where we'd get a, a, you know, a, a paragraph or something from some dreary novel by François Mauriac or somebody like that, and we'd go around and then just translate it all. Sentence one, you know, and it's crap, so I'm going to correct you, and then sentence two, and you look the other way to avoid being nominated. So we're associating uh, L1 use with translation work of the most traditional kind. And I'm not advocating we go back to that, although uh, in actual fact, there's not a lot of research which indicates that it's counterproductive. It might work sometimes. The point that I want to make is that translation shouldn't be seen as that kind of old-fashioned literary translation. Translation is surely one of the most preeminently important social skills that anyone can have in a multilingual, multicultural situation. That's what we're doing. We're talking about communicating between two cultures, and that kind of mediation is going to involve elements of linguistic translation. For many kids in many contexts, and I'll give my daughter as an example, I mean, uh, her English, my elder daughter, her English is very good. She doesn't really ever need it much. But when she does need it, it's either when she was younger to translate pop songs from English into French for her friends. That's what she was doing. And then as a student, uh, she's having to read texts and she's also then translating them into French, her dominant language, to help her friends. She's translating all of the time. And we are all translating all of the time if we're living in that in-between world between two languages. So my argument would be that translation is not um, an unimportant skill. I would have said it's a centrally important skill in almost any kind of contemporary multicultural context. So I demolish that one. The, the second argument that's often given is this idea that um, it's a, the teaching is a zero-sum game. So if you spend any time or your students spend time speaking Czech, that's time when they could be speaking English instead. So it's the idea that any Czech detracts from the English. But I think this is uh, wrong in, in, in a number of ways. But the most obvious way is that if, for example, you want to set up a fairly complicated activity at a low level, and the language that you need to set that activity up is simply far too hard for the A1, A2 students, but you still want to do the activity, well, what are you going to do if you use Czech Right, they can get going and they can do it, and they can speak lots of English. If you try to do it in English only, the activity will probably fail, and it's just a waste of time. I'll give one other example um, when it comes to this kind of issue. We've probably all had that experience when we're doing speaking activities, where we set up an activity, right, understand, yeah, good, go, and then the students just don't say anything. They don't say anything at all. So one of the approaches that we sometimes take is we then give them time to brainstorm it and we ask them to brainstorm it in English and they don't come up with any ideas. So they still don't do it and the activity still doesn't work. A very, very simple technique in any kind of context is to give the students time to prepare the content, the ideas of what they want to say, and let them use any language they like. Then there's a much greater chance the activity will work in English. So here we've got a simple equation, a little bit of tolerated Czech or whatever language will facilitate the production of a lot, lot more of the target language. So it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, the third one, and uh, Hugh referred to this briefly, the idea that you, as a learner, need to learn to think in the other language. I've said this many, many times on training courses to my trainees, you've got to get your students thinking in this other language. And I apologize to anyone who I said that to. There are really big problems with this whole area. First of all, what does it mean to think in a language? There is no psychological consensus of what this means. Do we actually think in a natural language anyway? There are times when we might think in a language. Let's imagine a situation where you're, um, you've got to make an excuse or apologize, and you might rehearse something subvocally. Or you're on a first date or a blind date, what are you going to say first when you first meet the other person? And you might well rehearse this, and you would be using language. But most of the time, <clears throat> we don't actually think in another language. We're probably using what has been called mentalese, 
which is not coded in the same way as English or Czech or whatever it may be. I think in any case, what we mean when we say students need to learn to think in another language is they need to stop thinking altogether. What we really want them to do is to be able to produce language in an automatic and a proceduralized way so they don't have to translate from one to the other. We want them to stop thinking, okay, this is what I want to say in my language and I'm going to translate it. We want them to acquire sufficient language skills for them to produce big, big chunks of language, phrases typically, without having to think and translate every word. So we want them to stop thinking, we want the language production to become automatic. And that's a very, very different thing from this kind of claim. If it does mean anything, what does it mean to think in another language? Well, what research as exists would suggest that in order to think in another language, you need to be at least B2 level. Because it's only at that level you've got the kind of proceduralized language knowledge which would enable you to produce language automatically. Well, how many of your classes are above B2 level? Probably not that many. We've got to get the students to get there first. So we've got a, an, another big issue here. This is nonsense and you couldn't anyway stop people thinking in whatever language they want. You can stop them speaking it, but you can't stop them thinking it. The fourth frequent claim is that translation promotes fossilization. There's not a single piece of research evidence to back this up. Fossilization is perhaps not the preferred term now um, for this uh, characteristic of language development where you get stuck in a particular pattern of errors. But we know what it means those advanced level students with a fossilized um, missing third person singular S in the present tense. But this kind of fossilization will take place irrespective of whether L1 is used in the classroom. And this is very, very clear. So these are the four main reasons. The fifth reason I haven't put up here is the commercial reason. There is this idea that students actually want English only. There's no evidence for that either. Some may, some don't. In any case, if we're doing something for a purely commercial reason, can we justify it as professionals? There are all sorts of misbeliefs about language learning. One of them, apart from the idea that English is best learnt through English only, another idea is that English is best learnt with the native speaker. Does that mean we only employ native speakers even though we know it's wrong in order to get commercial gain? It would be the most unethical thing you could possibly do. So the commercial reason, I appreciate that it's there, but I think it needs to be explored a little bit more. On the other hand, why might we allow Czech in the classroom? And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. First of all, the research base. How many research papers do you think exist which demonstrate that English is best learned through English only? Not a single one. Not one. There has never, ever been a piece of research which demonstrates that this is the case. Conversely, how much research has been done to indicate that learning English may be uh, helped through using your own language? There's a huge body of literature out there now. It's a huge, huge body, ranging from um, vocabulary acquisition to writing skills. One of the things we know about writing skills is that when it comes to summarizing arguments and putting them in, in a structure, in an essay, people do that better when they do that kind of work in their own language first. So the research body is very, very clear. And, and it's so clear now that if anybody is uh, promoting the idea that English is best learned through English only, the onus of responsibility needs to be on them now to justify it. But nobody has done so. So I think we should turn it around the other way. If you're if you've got a policy where it's English only, you should be feeling a bit guilty. Not because you use Czech from time to time. Research evidence is clear. There's also a big shift in learning objectives. I mean, what, are, what are our students doing in the classroom? And I think this is also connected to the native speaker uh, debate and the native speaker idea. Until relatively recently, it seemed to be assumed that the objective of students learning English was to become like native speakers. I mean, albeit deficient native speakers, but that was their kind of end goal. Well, again, this seems to me self-evidently nonsense. Why would you want to become like a native speaker? You might want to become a bit like a native speaker, but are you likely to achieve it? 
Are you likely to achieve that in, let's say, three hours of English per week in school? No, you're not, frankly. And it may simply be quite inappropriate. In most uh, pragmatic, functional contexts, why you need the language, you don't need to be C2. You don't need to understand Chaucer. Apart from anything else, we don't really know what the native speaker means. It, it, it's a very loose construct. There's a much clearer consensus emerging now that uh, the student's task in learning another language is to become an effective and a very effective bilingual. They need to be able to switch from one language code to another. That's what is going to determine how valuable their language skills are. So in that sense, the, 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 the ultimate objectives of learning and teaching, we've made a shift. We want to develop competent bilingualism or multilingualism and not some kind of forlorn hope to develop deficient native speakers, which is doomed to fail. There is another uh, side to this, and this is, um, if I may mention, the common European framework of reference without sending you all to sleep. This, this document, um, which has been so abused for so many years and has just become a testing tool, is quite interesting in the sense what it was developed for. The whole European Council project was to promote cultural understanding within Europe. That's what it's all about. That's why all the money has been spent. It's about promoting cultural intercultural competence. And if you conceive of language teaching and language learning as the promotion of intercultural competence, I don't see how you could possibly ban the, langu the other language. And we, we hear people say, oh yeah, what about false friends? Well, it's precisely areas like false friends which are worth exploring. What is the difference between phrase A in English and phrase B in Czech, which look similar but there are cultural uh, associations with them? Let's explore it in whatever language we want to. So promoting intercultural competence necessarily entails permitting L1 in the classroom. So we've got shifts and objectives. The psychology of learning, I'm going to just deal with this in about 30 seconds. It's very easy. We don't really know what it means to learn a language. We don't have any clear neurological model of what it means, what happens. We, we, we simply don't know. We've got lots of ideas. Um, but there are one or two things which are fairly clear. We're talking about the acquisition of linguistic knowledge, among other things. But just taking the knowledge or the skills, whatever you want to call it, we do know as a fundamental of all learning that all skills and knowledge learning is premised and built and scaffolded on previous knowledge. It's always going to be built and scaffolded on previous knowledge. So when I go into a language classroom as a student of whatever language, I'm necessarily going to be comparing what I'm learning to the knowledge that I have already which is relevant. And in my case, what would be relevant is my knowledge of other languages, my own first and foremost. And because, too, we're talking about an increasingly multicultural and multilingual world, many of our students are coming into classroom with multiple lingui linguistic codes at their command. So my kids, uh, or the kids of my, my teachers in, in Vienna, who've got, let's say, German, um, Serbian, uh, and possibly a bit of French maybe, and they're learning English, they're going to be using all of these as resources, and it makes sense to leverage those resources. That's enough on the psychology learning. It's can't go much further. Learner preferences I referred to just briefly. <coughs> um, quite a lot of research has been done asking uh, learners, you know, what do they prefer? And although many learners say, because they've got this naturalistic idea that just learn it as if it, immersion situation, uh, it seems that at least 50% of most learners in most contexts, especially lower levels, would prefer to have a teacher who uh, can speak their own, like can share the language that they have. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be using it all of the time in the class, but it's very, very reassuring to most learners to feel, ah, well, they understand my problems. And again, when it comes to things like false friends, well, it kind of helps, doesn't it? Um, there is an issue here, of course, if you're talking about a teacher who doesn't share the student's language, which I'll come back to. There's a question of efficiency. Um, it, it's, it's very often the case that an attempt to teach English through English alone, or, or through pictures and whatever else, flashcards, is going to take an awful long time. And a particularly memorable occasion, I was watching a, a trainer, uh, no, he wasn't a trainee, he was a teacher in a school I was managing in Spain, and he was teaching animals. And because I was observing him, he assumed that he wouldn't... <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he assumed that he couldn't use Spanish in the classroom and he was teaching animals. So he started with, he had this list of animals and um, he said to the kids, um, uh, quite young kids, about 10, he said, okay, listen, oink, 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 what's that? 
And, and the kids all shouted out in Spanish, Cerdo, Cerdo, Cerdo. He said, yeah, but in English, what is it? Cerdo, Cerdo. And they're kind of enthusiastic. And eventually one kid says, pi, pi. He says, yeah, good, okay, listen, pig, pig. And they'll repeat. And he went through a few animals like that, quack, quack, moo, moo. It was all going fine. And then he said, okay, now listen, what's this one? And he went, meh, meh. And the kids started shouting out, ova, ova, meaning sheep. And um, his Spanish was not that good, but he did know that ova was sheep, or oveja. And he said, no, 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 not a sheep, it's another animal. And he said again, meh, meh, what's that? He was looking for goat. That was what he was looking for. And he'd gone through this whole thing at least five minutes and losing control of the class because he didn't want to give them the translation. I mean, come on, boy, just get on with it. And <laughs> in the end, he was getting really flustered. Really, really flustered. You've got your boss in there watching you. you know. Okay, let's, let's break the rules. Let's use Spanish. So he said, okay, listen. Um, in, uh, in Spanish, goat is cabron. Well, unfortunately, for those of you who speak Spanish, the Spanish for goat is cabra, and cabron means wanker. <laughs> so, kind of close. And the class just collapsed. And so did I. I actually fell off my chair laughing so much. It was actually very sad. We had to take him off the class. He didn't dare face them ever again. <laughs> because he then became El Profesor Cabron. That was, that was him. And you, you know, come on, just tell them from the beginning and make sure you get it right. So efficiency, no, not always. Uh, and the last reason I'd suggest is technology. There, there are many, many um, reasons why technologically we need to address this use of L1 in the classroom. Primarily, but not exclusively, because of things like Google Translate. All students will be using Google Translate, and I would imagine that most of you do or have done some of the time. Uh, and I use it myself all of the time. The problem with Google Translate, of course, um, is it isn't always right. Now there is this, this tool out there, um, it's improving, and I'll say more about Google Translate and Microsoft Translator. There is this tool, and it's, it's a really, really valuable learning tool, or at least it's a valuable cheating tool. And our students need help in using it intelligently. In the same way that we're going to give them training with all sorts of other tools, it used to be the case that we would encourage students to use monolingual dictionaries and learn how to use all the features. We'd give them training in, in the tools. So we need to train our students to use the technological tools that are available out there well. And if we're not giving them that training, um, I think we're failing them in some way. So to summarize that, there, there's, there's a huge, huge number of, uh, of reasons why we might consider um, some kind of L1 allowed in the classroom and times when we might actually encourage it actively. And there is not a single piece of research evidence, as I said, which suggests that it would be beneficial to ban it. Now, I said all of this because, um, because Guy Cook is not here and he would have expanded further. And I, and I want to now spend what time is remaining looking at much more practical things. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about reverse translation, which Hugh talked about. What did you call it? Two-way translation two-way translation, reverse translation, I decided to focus on technology. Because if I talk about technology, you'll think I'm up to date and modern and young and all of that. Or maybe you won't. The um, question, just before I come to that, though, is when I'm talking about this topic, people often say to me, and we had a question from a gentleman just, just while you were chatting, he said, yeah, but what about the situation when the teacher doesn't share the language of the students? And this is, of course, extremely common. So it could be that you've got multiple language backgrounds in the classroom, or it could be that actually everybody speaks Czech, it's just the teacher is the only person who can't. What do you do then? And it's actually a very revealing question. Because the answer to these questions is, well, no, but the students can, even if the teacher can't. And there are many, many things that you can usefully do in the classroom or get the students to do which will involve them using their L1 and it doesn't matter whether you speak it as a teacher or not. So I'm going to look at primarily uh, the learning-centered tools which are valuable rather than teacher-centered techniques. And there are many, many teacher-centered techniques if you do share that language, but I want to look at the learner-centered things. And the first one is the dictionary. I mean, there has to be a, a dictionary first and foremost as the most valuable learning tool. Better than course books. 
Now, if you're learning a language as I'm learning German, I'm not going to go and buy the latest volume from Klett or Langenscheid. I'm going to buy myself a good dictionary or get a good dictionary. And dictionaries are quite interesting because we, we've come a long way in dictionaries, and it used to be the received wisdom that the best dictionary was a monolingual dictionary and, and an advanced dictionary, something like, I don't know, Oxford Advanced or the Macmillan Red Dictionary. This was always presented as the best kind of dictionary. And as teachers, we've often perhaps discouraged our students from using those little pocket ones or the digital equivalents. The situation has changed, though, and dictionary production has changed massively in the last 10 years. First of all, most publishers have stopped printing dictionaries. They're giving up because there are so many good things online. Now, if you use uh, an English-English uh, online dictionary, um, with some exceptions, most students are going to end up using something like Chambers or whatever is offered to them on their first Google search. And most of these English-English dictionaries are completely inappropriate for the students. They would do far better to use a learner's dictionary, but they don't necessarily know they exist. So there are dictionaries from Macmillan. One is a particularly good example because it's free online and it's a good dictionary. But the problem with the Macmillan dictionary is it's fundamentally English-English, although there are other versions. There is no research evidence at all to suggest that using good English-English dictionaries leads to more learning gains than using good bilingual dictionaries. And the latest generation of dictionaries are what we call semi-bilingual or bilingualized dictionaries, which have all of the information um, that you would get in a good dictionary like Macmillan or uh, Longman Contemporary, has all of that information, plus it has translations as well. And there are increasing numbers of these, and many, many of them are online. Now, I don't know Czech, I've never tried to study Czech, but German is something which I do know about. And in German, we're quite lucky, because in German, for German-English language pairings, there are some phenomenally good dictionaries out there. And they are far, far better than anything else that is available in some languages. Um, one of them uh, that you could turn to would be the Cambridge Klett Comprehensive German. It's an old-fashioned thing, but it's not really very good anymore. Far better and free for English German, a dict CC which has other language pairings. It, its quality varies from, from one language to another. And Leo, which is probably the best uh, English German dictionary at the moment. These things are online. You can run them in the background while you're doing other tasks. And they have all of the information that a good monolingual dictionary will have, plus the translations, plus huge entries if you want to follow them down with all the sort of high-frequency collocations and patterns that are associated with them. So our students really need to know about these tools. They need to find what's best for them, and what's best for them is likely to depend on what it is they're trying to achieve in their learning. So it'll vary from student to student and within a class. My uh, suggestion, because I can't recommend particular English Czech dictionaries, is that you would ask your students if you don't know yourself. There will be a number available. But you need to give them some sort of task. And my suggestion is a relatively simple task, where you give them a set of words. I've chosen on the left here, business dear, a set of uh, high frequency, very high frequency words, which all have some kind of syntactical or collocational issues associated with them. Give them a set of words, smaller than this, use two or three or do it a few times. If they can do this online with their phones or, or with tablets, even better, but if not at home, ask them to try two different dictionaries and give them a pile of questions and ask them to compare the dictionaries and let them decide which is most useful for them. It's fairly simple. Okay? We need to train them in using these extraordinarily good bilingual resources that are out there. Um, it really does depend on which language pairing. I mean, in terms of the, the published book dictionaries, um, Collins Cobild has some superb semi-bilingualized dictionaries for English, Korean, and English, Japanese. You'll get some very good ones as well for English and Latin American Spanish. But you won't get such good ones typically for English Czech because there's not so much money involved in that, unfortunately. But think yourself lucky you speak Czech rather than, let's say, Macedonian because there your choices are very limited. So some dictionary training using a task of this kind will make sense. Dictionaries are going to be used for all sorts of reasons, but one of the reasons that people will use them is when they're involved in extensive reading. Now, the problem with extensive reading for, for learners is understanding enough of the text to be able to understand the rest of the text. You've got to have a certain lexical threshold. And it is highly unlikely that the sorts of things that you want to read are going to be at your level. I'm, um, 
I like, I'm like James and, and Jeremy, I'm, I'm interested in classical music. And you know what I wanted to understand first in German? I wanted to understand the meaning of Goethe's, uh, Schubert's Winterreise. Now this is using some pretty weird 19th century poetic language. But that was what I wanted to do and that was what motivated me. So I needed some way of doing this and what I'm going to use for that is I'm going to get a digital version of the lyrics that I want to read because that's what's motivating me and I want a dictionary running in the background which is providing a gloss. Now there's a lot of research gone into the use of glosses when you're involved in extensive reading. It makes sense to have them, to have them available. But what kind of gloss is the best one? Should it be using an English definition? Or should it be a translation? Or should it be both? Or should it be sort of multimodal with, let's say, pictures or bits of music or whatever going on there? And the research is actually quite contradictory. What is the best kind of gloss? But we can summarize it, uh, as Paul Nation has done, is the best kind of gloss is one that's comprehensible. And that is likely to be a bilingual gloss. It's likely to be. Uh, I'll talk more about this in, in the workshop when I'm looking at natural language processing in a couple of days. But again, this is a bilingual tool which we need to know how to use. We need to train our students how to use it. How can you run a bilingual dictionary in the background so you can hover over a word and just quickly look it up so you don't get blocked in enjoying your reading? So glossing is, is another area. Um, I need to talk about online translation because it's such a big area. I took a text here, I chose German because I can't compare Czech and English. So I looked at a, a website, um, a Bono website, interesting one there, you notice um, on the left there's one of the clicks will take you through to Bono Beauties. It is the most outrageous 1960s, 70s kind of objectification, commodification of women you could possibly imagine. It's really... <laughs> it could be good. It could be my search profile. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I don't know. Um, anyway, have a look at the Bono Beauties, just for a laugh, if nothing else. But I took the the main page, and, and this is, it doesn't matter if you don't. I took it in German, <clears throat> and this is the English. Now, one of these translations is a human translation from the same website. And one of them is an automatic translation. Have a read through and try to decide which is a human translation and which is an automatic translation. Can we have a vote? Who thinks that A is the human translation? And who thinks that B is the human translation? Uh, we, yeah, okay, that's, that's quite... And who hasn't really got a clue? I think it's reasonable, you've got to look at this quite carefully to decide um, the, uh, the human translation is the second one. And I want to look at what's going on here a little bit. Um, but first of all, I'll take two machine translations. I've taken Google and I've taken Microsoft Translate. Now, Google has improved massively, I mean, unrecognizably in the last 18 months with some language pairings. I've been told that English Czech is still not very good. But for English German, the accuracy has gone from something like 88% to 95% in the last 12 months. And for various uh, technological reasons, we can expect it to get better uh, for some kinds of texts, but not for all kinds of texts. It's going to get better and better and better. So. Let's just have a quick look at what's going on here. Uh, the second largest city of the Czech Republic, a cultural... And then in the first one, we got this of Southern Moravia to Prague. Now, that is simply because in the German, the preposition that's being used is Zweite Stadt nach Prague. Nach, which means either towards or after. But in that context, it means after. And Microsoft is unable to recognize in this context that nach here means after and not to. It's a fairly common problem. There are other issues too. In the first one, millennial history, and Google Translate has a thousand year history. Well, a thousand year history is preferable, probably, because the collocation is stronger. A thousand year history is a more likely collocation than millennial history. We don't use millennial in quite that way. 
So what Google has got going for it, which Microsoft Translate hasn't, is it's recognizing what we call bigrams, the, the likelihood of two words occurring together. So as it goes through its rendering into English, it's comparing this against the multi-billion word database of the probability of finding those two words together. And this is happening so fast you, c you can't even measure it. Which is why Google Translate on the whole is better than Microsoft Translate. Um, but this is much better in some languages, Chinese, Spanish and German, than it is in others. From a pedagogical point of view, in terms of the classroom, what we might do in the classroom, we need to train our students to use this intelligently. And the sort of thing we can do is we can give them hints or they can discover where the translation goes wrong. So this is my list of the sorts of things that go wrong with machine translation. We could simply hand this out as a list and we can get them to find examples. We could um, give them the translation into their own language and their job is to identify the mistakes in their own language because those mistakes will correspond to problems in English and the problems that these machine translation tools have are more or less the same as what the students have. It makes the same kind of mistakes. So we can give them this kind of training and we can show them what's going on. It works much better as a classroom activity though when the machine translation is rubbish. When it gets too good, the training has much less value. So if Google Translate is working too well, English Check, you'll find others online which are really pretty poor and they will be much better for training your students to use these things intelligently. Arabic, for example, is pretty rubbish. And one of the reasons that Arabic is rubbish is the whole issue of articles. It really struggles with articles. And you see if in the one here, or even the human one, We've got this, um, can offer the services at European level, and Bruno can provide the services at, you know, no, that's not what we would say in English. We wouldn't use the definite article there. We'd use no article, typically. But in the German, of course, it's a definite. So we can train our students to recognize the limitations and to use these tools better, and at the same time, we'll be sensitizing them to precisely the kind of language transfer problems that they're likely to have. So using the the whole area of online translation kind of makes sense because they're going to be doing it, they need to do it better. Right, vocabulary learning. I, I'll just give you a second to read this. This is where me and Stephen Crashton may disagree about a few things, but we'll, we'll come to that. There is a general not a total, but there's a general consensus these days that it makes sense at low levels to acquire a certain number of words, the most frequent words, through deliberate learning. Attack them fast. And even at higher levels, let's say a student who's um, going from B1, B2 to some kind of academic English IELTS, it might make sense to attack the academic word list and learn them in a very deliberate way. What we're talking about here is deliberate initial learning of a word, not being totally able to use it appropriately and accurately, syntactically and collocationally, but just being able to match this foreign word to what it means as an initial stage of learning. And you've got to go through that first. Yeah? There's a general acceptance. Incidental learning through extensive reading has uh, its value, and I'm not going to uh, in any way suggest that it doesn't have its place. It has a huge place, but later. The greatest value of that kind of extensive reading and listening is solidifying what knowledge you already have. But initial knowledge, best attacked through deliberate learning. The highest frequency words, the top 2,000. How to do it? Well, another quote. The best way of doing it, we've discovered, and again is fairly consensual, is we do it through learning bilingual word pairs. You know? When I'm learning German and I need to get basic words sorted out, the best way for me to learn, let's say, food items, is just to match them up. Not necessarily to have the word the apple with a picture of an apple, or that might help. Let's just have the apple, apple, shinken, ham, etc., etc., etc. This is pretty clear for not the youngest children, but anyone from about eight or nine onwards, to get that basic vocabulary level up so they've got enough vocabulary to be able to then read and listen. And the best way of doing this is almost certainly through some kind of deliberate learning and probably through flashcards. It's been researched quite a bit. Flashcards, if they're going to be bilingual, are likely to work better, probably for the simple reason that if you've got a target item and it's matched to a definition in English, the definition is going to be more complex than the word that you're learning. Try learning a word like happy. What kind of definition 
would match. Whereas if I've just got glücklich or something like that, I've got it. I'm recommending Quizlet for a number of reasons, and I don't have any vested interest. The first reason is it's free, and the second reason is that they're the basic version, and the second reason is that a huge number of language teachers are now using it. And the two links here, the first one is um, from a guy called Russell Stannard, who's produced a series of uh, really good videos, how to use Quizlet. Really good series of videos. The second one is a blog post from Lizzie Pinard, um, and she's got a, a, a downloadable PDF, and it's called something like An Idiot's Guide to Using Quizlet. Step-by-step, step, really simple instructions of how you log on, how you create the cards, what you do. And for those two resources alone, and there are others, I'd recommend Quizlet. So vocabulary cards, bilingual vocabulary cards. Video is another area. I mean, we're talking here about extensive reading and extensive listening. And I wanted to draw your attention to one particular resource, the TED website. TED talks are not for everybody, um, but they will be interesting for many students. And the TED website is an extraordinary repository of linguistic wealth. It's not just that you've got what should be fairly interesting talks. You have the possibility of toggling uh, subtitles on and off. And we know, again, from research, that subtitles, whether they're in English, the same language as the talk, or whether in your own language, can facilitate language learning. They've got these amazing subtitles, and often, for many of the talks, 30 languages are available. So it doesn't matter that you've got a multilingual class. But they also have, on, on the website, they've got transcripts. And the transcript kind of uh, gets highlighted, underlined. So when you're listening to it, the bit that you're listening to gets underlined. And you can go back and listen again and again, just drag the cursor back or your finger and listen to it again. It's a superb resource. And for anyone um, who is an adult, an intelligent adult learner, they've got to know about it. I'd like to mention another one, um, but I won't say anything more about this. There's a, there's a presentation. Um, is anyone from movies here in the room? Well, I mean, it looks an extremely rich resource. I've not used it with the class, but it's doing precisely the same thing. It's offering bilingual functionality. And... It's, it's worth finding out more. If you don't go to the talk, go and check out what it is on their stand. Like, I, sort of, we've never met, but I'll take my tip later on, okay? That's the talk, and I hope I've got the time right. Um, YouTube is, a, is another interesting possibility. This is in a much more creative way. And one of the things we've been doing a lot of in, in schools in Vienna is we're getting uh, kids to take YouTube videos that they like. It might just be a pop song or whatever, or something to do with uh, football, whatever it is short clips, and then they subtitle it in there in German, or sometimes in Turkish and other languages. And they get so excited when they've done this project, they stick the subtitles on, they post it on YouTube, and when you discover that this little bit of work you've done in the class has got 20,000 hits, because you've been the first person to subtitle some pop song, whatever it might be, um, the, 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 the sense of Power and motivation is really extraordinary. It's, it's a very, very simple tool to use. You need to set it up carefully in the classroom where the students work collaboratively and work on these subtitles. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a lovely little technique to use, getting the kids or adults to do their own subtitling from English into their language, not the other way around. But you could try the other way around. Um, Finally, I want to mention um, a, a guy called Joris van den Bosch. He's a high school teacher in Belgium. He's got a website. Um, which is full of really practical ideas. The school he works in is an international school, um, so he has to deal with this situation of uh, classes where you've got maybe seven or even eight different languages in the class. He's got some lovely activities, and this one is a really simple one. He asks these are teenagers, his students, he asks the teenagers um, to do as their homework, simply finding a short video in their own language which they really think is good or cool or interesting or whatever. That's the only thing they have to do. Kids take it in turn. So this is spread over a number of days or a number of weeks. The kids will come into the class, and their job is simply, first of all, to show the video. Nobody else in the room, can under or only a few people, can understand it, because it's in whatever language it might be. Let's say Portuguese or something. And the rest of the class speaks German or French or whatever. The kid shows the video, explains why they've chosen the video, explains what they like about it, and then the class start asking questions. Explain what's going on. What, what, is, what is this person happening? What, is, what are the songs here? So the, the student is standing there with the controls of the video showing this, and they'll go back and they'll listen, explain, this is, he says this, they say that. It's a lovely empowering moment, and it gives a really genuine reason for using English, because that's the shared language, because they're translating from source material.
So a lovely little thing, and Joris has got some other pretty cool ideas. There's a selection of um, things that you might want to read if you're interested in this. On the theoretical side, there's really quite a lot. The article by uh, Graham Hall and, and Guy Cook, 2012, is, is probably the most useful source, although maybe I've updated a little bit with the one from the Routledge Handbook of English Language Teaching from last year. The, 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 the theoretical reading is, is there, it's easy to get. On a practical level, there's really very little. You find websites like Yoris's website, which has got some very good stuff. You'll find on some of the publishers' websites, because now translation's okay, you'll find some good ideas coming along. Um, but in terms of books, there's not a lot. There's this book by Sheila Dera Mario Rinvalukri from 2002, um, and mine from a couple of years ago. But there isn't really anything else out there. More will be coming, because translation and L1 have come in from the cold. It's kind of okay to do it these days. You don't need to feel guilt, but we can start being creative. Uh, thank you very much. There's another talk. I see if I got the time right, uh, at 12.30. Margot Schata, is she here? She's talking uh, about um, translation, and, and that looks very interesting too. Teachers using L1. Okay. But it looks interesting and it's related. I'll stop there. I think I've got the timing right. Thank you very much. <laughs>